Hi everyone, it's Jerry. Let's have a look at a game from the Youth Games of 1976. On the white end, 18-year-old Armenian Simbat Laputian, a player who was about master strength for this game. He earned his international master title in 1982 and grand master title in 1984. His opponent, 13-year-old Gary Kasparov, still shy of his master rank. He earned that in 1978 and as one might have expected, tracked very quickly towards his Grandmaster title, earning that in 1980. This game a nice window into the young, tactical mind of Garry Kasparov. Let's have a look. Opening-wise, it is a King's Indian defense. In opening, Kasparov would go on to play throughout his whole career. Variation is Amish with F3. An aggressive system certainly can be an aggressive system. This is securing the bishop post on e3. How can it turn aggressive? Put your bishop on e3, queen on d2, form this battery. In some order, queenside castles, h4, dark square bishops exchange, go right after the black king's throat. It's not to be in this game. It is black who goes on the offensive beginning with just a touch of pressure on the weakest square in white's camp, d4. That is a hole, so some defense is necessary over that. Bishop e3 may be tempting to immediately strike at d4 with e5, currently the only pawn break in the position for black. It is not well-timed, however. e5 can be met with d5, and after knight d4, this is not a good sequence, not because... White can win a pawn. Not a wise choice for White to give up their better bishop for that knight. But rather, because White can play knight to e2 and ask the knight, what are you doing in my house? The knight cannot be maintained. And what exactly has been accomplished with this sequence by Black? It remains to be seen. In fact, Black has expedited White's development, and White also enjoys a nice static advantage pawn established on d5, some space. e5, something to keep in mind, just not yet. In this game, a6, rook b8, introducing an additional pawn break. e5, and now there is b5. Both try and chip away at white's pawn trio. From here, a little bit awkward to complete development on the king's side. Certainly don't want to go to the edge with the knight. If the knight's favorite square is taken away with the pawn. Going to e2. This masks the bishop from seeing b5. Maybe black plays b5 here. Some other order. If the bishop goes here with this in mind next, well, the queen is not seeing d4. This may spark a knight d7 move, unleashing the bishop and only then following up with e5. And it may be the case that a knight can be maintained on d4. Okay, in this game we have uh, white doesn't commit with either kingside minor piece, rook b1 and then b4, looking to grab some space on the queen side. Certainly looks menacing, it certainly looks strong for white, but where is white weak? Where is white deficient with this plan? What is white neglecting? kingside development. Black is castled. White is still three tempi away from getting castled. It is at this point where black now welcomes exchanges, hits at this stage with e5. Let's see how things are a little bit different. After d5, knight d4, white follows at this point with knight to e2, but I want to highlight a nice tactic to be familiar with. Suppose white wants to get rid of this strong bishop, this Fianchetta bishop, still looking for maybe an attack like this. What is the issue with this move? It's true that white, in this scenario with the rook already on b1, will not be going queenside. It would be completely inconsistent to go queenside here, having moved the b pawn, the rook on b1. Okay. What is the issue with bishop to h6? Feel free to pause the video. Okay, important tactic to be familiar with, knight takes e4, hitting the queen and opening the queen's eyes to this check, 
This is not just the win of a pawn, but the game. But the game. Well, queen takes bishop. This is already a minus three evaluation. So there is no bishop to h6. It's knight to e2. And now the follow-up, c5. Looking to cement this knight in there. So how should white react to this? Might be tempting to grab on c5 and say my rook's eyes are opened and thank you so much for giving me a connected passed pawn. At the same time, black would be saying, thank you for allowing my knight to be maintained on d4. It's going to be a great bother. And if you ever get rid of it, I too will then have uh, a connected passed pawn. So what does white do? White captures on c6, takes this pawn on passant. Recapture. This variation, this sequence here is giving up a pawn. Black is giving up a pawn. But in the process, lines, uh, files, diagonals are opening up. And black is preparing for a tactical shot. We are at this point. How to follow up from here? What do we have in the game? C5. Creating more pawn tension, more open lines. B takes C5. And what to do at this stage? Move 16. Black to move, what would you do? Okay, here we go. I must admit that this is one of the first moves that crossed my mind, and a quick reason I assigned for that was, isn't it a good idea to demote the knight? You know, just force it back to its home square? No. 13-year-old Gary snaps the pawn on e4. Still, with this idea in mind, I highlighted it in a different scenario with the bishop on h6, but we're seeing another instance where knight takes on e4 is there. And I also want to point out the importance of not taking on b1 first. So we're going to look back to this position here and see why taking on this square first and then taking on e4 is not good and why taking on e4 straight away is good. The move played in the game. What do you do? Well, if you take with the knight, you lose the rook. So you got to take with the pawn. And now in the game comes queen h4. The reply at this stage is not best. What white plays is g3. Considered best is bishop to f2. And I'm highlighting this variation because it's something that 13-year-old Kasparov had to have calculated. He needed to know what to do in this scenario. Black to move, what would you do in reply to bishop f2? Okay, the only move here that maintains equality, any other move, and white would be better, the only move that works here for black is to take on c3, and so we are seeing a point, the main point, in keeping tension between the rooks. Black wants to have this bishop takes knight move available in reply to bishop f2. So how would play follow from here? Best play is liquidating like so. Queens are exchanged, and we enter this double bishop ending reading as equal. Something that he needed to calculate was this bishop to f2 move at this stage right here. How is it different if black first exchanges rooks and only then takes on e4 and then gives the check? Well, bishop to f2, there is no bishop takes knight. And while queen e4, queen takes e4 at this stage may seem tempting, there's a way out for white by simply castling. Knight is defended, and this bishop is, in def is defended indirectly. Queen takes bishop, would be met with a nice skewer. Queen takes queen, thank you for the rook with check, and only then will I take your queen. If you've lost count, white's up a rook with this variation. So how important it is to keep this tension, keep white in a state where this Bishop takes knight move is available. Knight takes e4, crushing move. Well, 
uh, the best move, I should say. Queen h4 in the game, what was played, not bishop f2, g3, and only now do we have rook takes rook. King to f2. Now, whether or not Kasparov still had this position in his calculations, did he work this one out? I don't know. This next move, there's an only move here that maintains an advantage for black. Every other move and white is winning. What is the saving move here? What is the best move for black in this position? Note what's going on, first of all. Queen is hit. Rook is hit. What are you going to do about that? Black to move, what would you do? Okay, here we go. Best move, move played in the game. Rook to b2. What you should be looking to do in this position as black is move your queen, get out of harm's way, and throw a check, but there's no good checks. No, no, no. I mean, what do you do? No good checks. They're all covered. Rook b2 says, you take my queen, I take your queen. That's what happened in the game. Suppose the queen takes the rook. Well, now we see the power of this dark square bishop. If queen takes rook, bishop takes bishop check. And there's no good solution for white. I'll just show a couple of variations. This one's simple. If king g2, it's a mate and two. With check and checkmate. And if king goes back home, we would have bishop takes knight. And then queen takes pawn, crushing. One of these two will fall. No saving him. This is not working. That's a pinned bishop. So, any other variation? Not really. Keep in mind, if you're not taking the queen right now, black is up the exchange. So what is played? Pawn takes queen. Rook takes queen. It's getting simplified. We're entering, entering a technical phase now. It certainly was tactical there in the middle game. It's a technical phase now. King e3, rook c2, king d3. How to react at this stage? Another pop quiz in this ending. What would you do? Black to move. Okay, here we go. Rook takes knight. And then pawn takes pawn. Why is this best? Well, consider an alternative, right? If you play rook b1, white replies and wins a point, let's say. The other variation is to give up a point. Give up five, get three, get four. This is what we have in the game. We enter this simplified position where it is clearly better for black. Materially balanced, but positionally superior. Why? Better structure. Better bishop, right? A nice pawn island of three. All white pawns are isolated. Black has the better bishop. Black has the initiative, throwing the first punch, also throwing white on their heels. Has to crawl up into a ball. Has to defend e4. More pressure on e4, more defense, and a nice follow-up, rook e5, immobilizing the pawn. And something more. There's now some lateral movement targeting these half-dead pawns. What do you do here? In the game a4, this allows f5, move played in the game. If king to d2, it's true, this prevents f5. f5 is not good here, but there's rook h5, and these pawns are falling. And this one is going to fall with check. So what is played? a4, f5, this pawn's going. So white tries to get some activity. Rook b1, bishop takes e4. This is a passer, and it runs fast. Rook b6, f4, rook takes a, f3. Bishop f5 looking to get here, push the pawn through. Check, king to d2, f2 nearby, rook to e1. Bishop e2 prevents that, but... This bishop has responsibility, so black just tries to deflect it. Bishop to g4, you take my bishop, I get a queen. White gets out of the way. Rook to e1, behind the pawn, and a nice interference move on this move, 36. Bishop to f5. 
once more. Bishop can't take. And what are you doing about f1 equals queen next? No good solution. So what's tried is a5. A couple ways, many ways to win from here. This one seems very clean. What was played in the game is bishop takes bishop. Just a little bit of calculation. After rook takes pawn, it appears that white's going to get one of these two next, but that's not the case. After rook to f1, white resigns. Take my bishop, I take your rook. And if you take my rook, I take the rook. So white is not going to win a piece. This is completely winning for Team Black. Now, I did carry it out. I was a little bit curious of what the cleanest approach would be in this ending. When I have a look at this, the uh, the variation I ended up going forward with ended up into some uh, pawn race, both sides queening. It should never get to that point. I was thinking to myself, well, I'll just run up here, and you only ever move the bishop here once a7 to a8 is actually a threat. But the absolute cleanest, in my opinion, is to get the bishop immediately on the diagonal, not just to stop the pawn, but to stop the white king from even thinking about hunting the c5 pawn. This one key move kills all counterplay on the spot. A nice wall is formed, and from here it is smooth. King just vacuums up the uh, h pawns, and yeah, pick your favorite way to queen at that stage. Anyhow, didn't get to that point after rook to f1. White resigned. So, very nice play, it's true. The setup that white went with, rook b1 and b4, wasn't optimal, but still a nice illustration of how to chip away in the center, open lines, diagonals, and that knight takes e4 move. Something to certainly be familiar with in multiple scenarios. So, if we have a look at, uh, tail the tape on this game, see how accurate they're playing at uh, this age. Um, 13 year old Kasparov, not bad, right? Looking at the inaccuracies, mistakes, and blunders, we have three inaccuracies, one mistake, zero blunders by Team White, and 13 year old Gary Kasparov, one inaccuracy, no mistakes, no blunders, average centi pun loss for each 21 and 12. Anyhow, as usual, feel free to leave any feedback to this video in the comments section below. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care.